All right, hi everyone. We are going to be looking at our next unit. So we're going to start unit number five, which is thermochemistry and kinetics. And with thermochemistry, um, thermo means heat, and that's what we're going to start with. So we're going to be looking at temperature and heat and how that works in chemistry. So energy is the ability to do work or produce heat. And so with energy, um, chemistry focuses on the produce heat part. So this is what we learn in chemistry. Next year when you take physics, this ability to do work, that's what you'll focus on. So the unit for energy is joules, which is named after the scientist named James Prescott Joule, and the symbol is a capital J. So there are two types of energy. You have kinetic energy and you have potential energy. Now potential energy, which I think I spelled that wrong, but I did, let's fix that. Potential energy is energy that is stored, so it's stored in the chemical bonds between atoms. Okay, so this is the energy stored in the bonds between atoms. Your kinetic energy comes from the energy of movement. Okay, so as the atoms move and vibrate and shake, okay, um, that's the kinetic energy. Now, um, back in August, we and all throughout the year, we've been talking about the law of conservation of matter, and there's one that's very similar to it is the law of conservation of energy. This says in any chemical or physical process, energy is not created or destroyed. Okay, it's not created or destroyed. Energy is conserved, meaning it remains the same. Um, and so energy in chemistry is used to break or form intermolecular forces, which remember intermolecular forces are the forces um, between molecules. Okay, and so when you break the intermolecular um, forces that results in a physical change. However, energy can also use to break or form the intramolecular forces, which are between the atoms in the molecule itself, and that results in a chemical change. So depending on what the energy is being used to do, um, whether it's to break or form those inter or intramolecular forces, that can tell you what type of change or reaction will happen. So one thing we can do is we can look at how the kinetic energy is related to its phase or its state of matter. So if we look at the different phases, we have solid, liquid, and gas, and these are also referred to as the states of matter. Okay. Um, so with the spacing of an atom, so remember solids are very, uh, they're considered tightly packed. They're very close together um, and they are always constantly vibrating okay um, and so these are going to have just like a low kinetic energy which we abbreviate as ke um, so for example the way you might see that in a diagram is if all these pink dots i'm drawing are atoms notice they're very close together um, and normally kind of like in comics you would draw these two lines indicating that they're vibrating um, in place. So not really um, moving around, but they are vibrating while staying in the same place. Now, liquids are um, connected still by those intermolecular forces, but um, loosely connected. Um, and so they move as well as vibrate, um, but they move in the same direction because they are still connected so when they flow so these guys are going to have about a medium kinetic energy in terms like when compared to a solid or a gas so for example 
if you have, oh, I'm going to make this smaller. So if you have a liquid, notice these atoms are a little more spread apart, um, but as they're moving, they're going to all move in the same direction. Just like when you pour out a water bottle, all of the water goes in the same direction, kind of like a conga line. They're all connected. Um, whereas with a gas, these are spread really far apart. Um, and they move quickly and they move in all in different directions um, and because they're moving quickly um, we know that they have a high kinetic energy um, so again they're moving in all kinds of directions that's why if someone farts it you know it's not just the person behind them that smells it it is everybody so if these are our molecules and our gas um, we will draw the lines being longer showing that they're moving faster and i'm po and i'm doing them in all different directions showing that they're moving everywhere okay so temperature is abbreviated as a capital t and temperature is a measure an indirect measure of the kinetic energy in an object Okay, um, so because that energy is what's there, it's moving and things like that. So if I have a high temperature, that means I have a high amount of kinetic energy versus a low temperature would get mean that I have a low amount of kinetic energy. Um, and so it also is going to measure the heat indirectly. So heat, which is given the abbreviation of a lowercase letter Q, which I know doesn't really make sense, but unfortunately capital H and lowercase h were, are already being used in other um, places. So we had to use Q, all right? So Q, or heat, measures the energy that is transferred, okay, from one object to another um, and it's because of a temperature difference between them so when they have a different level of kinetic energy meaning they have different temperatures then heat or will transfer so the kinetic energy transforms into heat and it will move from one object to another so one thing to note is that only changes in temperature um, can be detected and it flows from a um, hot object um, to a cooler um, object so um, one thing to keep in mind that if it's hot right that means it has a high temperature and a high kinetic energy and a cooler object is a low temperature um, and a low kinetic energy but one thing I want to point out that there's no such thing as cold it's just heat and lack of heat okay and so the way we measure that energy is with um, a couple of units so um, one thing is a um, is a calorie okay with a lowercase letter c and so this is the amount of heat required to increase the temperature of one gram of pure water by one degree Celsius. Okay, that's the definition of a calorie. And so what happens is if you have, um, you can also measure things with kilocalories, which is 1,000 little calories or 1,000 or 1 kilocalorie right so that's kind of our conversion there and this is um, considered to be one nutritional calorie with a capital letter C um, which actually I'm going to change that here so we don't really refer to it as a kilocalorie so capital letter C or versus lowercase letter C um, and so it's one nutritional calorie meaning this is what you see on food items on the back of your label the other one that we use is the joule, which we mentioned earlier. It's the official unit of heat and energy. Um, it's the most common. It's named after James Prescott Joule, and we know it's a capital letter J. Um, the little c calorie is abbreviated like that, and the big c calorie is abbreviated that way. 
Um, and so this is the units that we measure things. So remember, um, you know, mass is measured in grams, um, volume is measured in liters, so energy is measured in joules, um, and also calories. So one thing to keep in mind with heat is that we have this concept of what the universe is um, being made up of our system and our surroundings. So our system is whatever um, we are studying or our focus is. Um, and then the surroundings is literally everything else in the entire universe. Um, and so when we look at at a system and how heat flows in and out of that system, th we find that there are two different types of processes, that there is endothermic processes and exothermic processes, okay? So with an endothermic, endo sounds like in. So this is when a, pr a system absorbs heat. Now the system could be your body, it could be water, it could be a chemical reaction, it could be anything. Whatever your system is, it absorbs heat. You're in an exothermic process, this is when it releases heat. So think exo sounds like exit, okay? So it's exiting, it's leaving the system. So the way that looks like is the system has heat going into this, so your heat goes into the system, and so the system temperature will increase, okay, because it's absorbing heat. And because its temperature is increasing, that tells us that the molecules are moving faster than they were before because they've absorbed that energy and it's turned in to kinetic energy. It's increasing. Whereas an exothermic process, the heat is being released. It's going out of the system. So that tells you that your system temperature is going to decrease. It's losing heat, which means the molecules are moving slower because the kinetic energy that it had before has gone down. And so when we look at these processes, okay, it could be a physical or a chemical process, if it's a endothermic or exothermic reaction, um, then we're looking at something that is going to be a chemical process if, it, if we're referring it to it as a reaction. Now, for an endothermic reaction, okay, um, remember, anytime we have a chemical reaction, we have a chemical equation. So let's say we have A plus B, and it's producing C plus D. Well, that tells us if it's absorbing heat, that means it's happening at the beginning. So that means energy is a reactant. You'll find it on the left side of the equation. If you're talking about an exothermic reaction, that means energy is going to be a product. It's released after the experiment has happened. So I'm gonna show you. So if we just reverse that equation, you have A plus B plus heat as a product. And so one thing that you will find with that is we have these potential energy graphs. And a potential energy graph has potential energy on the x-axis, or excuse me, on the y-axis measured in joules. And it has time on our um, x-axis. And so we're going to draw a poten what a potential energy diagram looks like for both of these. So we're going to measure time in seconds and our potential energy is measured in joules. So when you have A and B, okay, this energy, okay, so let's say these are our reactants, A plus B, they have a certain amount of potential energy stored in their bonds, okay, and this potential energy it's also referred to as delta H, or our change in enthalpy. And so this is for our reactants. So this is um, delta H of our reactants. And what happens is in order for A and B to re actually react, it's going to have to absorb and increase its amount of energy 
in order to actually react. It will release a tiny amount um, or a certain amount and then you'll have the energy of our products here. Okay, And so what you can see is that um, this amount right here is referred to as the activation energy or the amount of energy required to get started. And so if you have delta H of your reactants, and this is delta H of our products, what you can see is that if we do products minus reactants, that there is an overall increase, okay, here, this is our delta H, and we see that it is positive, okay? That's because overall the amount of energy increased, so that means it is endothermic when it's positive. Now, the reverse is true for the exothermic process, okay, where our graph C and D start up high like this, and they, they still need a little bit of energy to get going, but then overall they're releasing a lot more to create its these new products A and B. And so you see that here our delta H of our reactants is much higher than the delta H of our products. And so overall, when you look at it, there is an overall decrease. So our delta H of the reaction is negative, okay? Um, and I forgot to add that here. So Rxn is reaction, and we can see that it's o an overall positive reaction for endothermic, but negative for exothermic. And you can see that these uh, exothermic reactions required a very small amount of activation energy. There wasn't a whole lot that it needed to get started. It could have been it just needed to be stirred or the movement of adding the chemicals together might have been enough, whatever it is. All right, so the change in enthalpy or delta H is the energy difference between the reactants and products Okay, so um, remember your reactants, so like chemical A, let's say you've got water, okay, which is H2O, okay, there is potential energy stored in those bonds, and there's a difference between the energy that's in the bonds of your reactants and a difference in the energy that's in your products. So RxN stands for reaction. It's a very common abbreviation. So the way you would calculate it for the whole reaction is just it's your products minus your reactants. Okay. And so for example, you can do it from the graph. So like if we said this was, you know, a hundred and this down here was twenty-five, then twenty-five minus one hundred is negative 75 joules, which we said that anything that is exothermic would be negative, right? Well, let's look at it if we don't have a graph. So here we have a chemical equation, okay, and it tells us that it wants us to calculate our delta H of our reaction, which we know delta H of our reaction is the delta H of our products minus the delta H of our reactants. Okay, and so um, we can use these numbers here with our chemical equation to figure that out. So if we look at the delta H of our products, that would be all of our products combined. So our products are over here. So we have four moles of carbon dioxide. So that would be four times negative 393.5 plus two moles of water, which water is negative 241.8 um, kilojoules. So let's make sure we put that in there. Um, and it's kilojoules per mole according to the chart. And since this is four moles and this is two moles, that means our moles will cancel out um, there once we multiply. So when we multiply these, we see that four times um, 393.5 um, being negative will give you um, negative 
574 kilojoules plus 2 times 241.8, again that's a negative number, gives us negative 483.6. And if we add those together, 1574, okay, then we get that the delta H of our products is negative 2057.6. So we do the same thing for our reactants. And we see that it's going to be 2 times, uh, let's see, this chemical is 227 kilojoules per mole. And this is moles plus um, 5 moles times oxygen is 0, 0 0.0 kilojoules per mole. So 5 times 0 is 0, so that cancels out. So then 2 times 227 is just 454 kilojoules. And so for our reaction, delta H of our reaction would just be the products. So that was negative 2057.6 kilojoules minus 454 kilojoules, which when we do that in our calculator, we get negative 2511.6 kilojoules and because that is an overall negative number that tells us that this was exothermic. So that's kind of how you would figure out the delta H of our reaction without the graph. So you could either do it without the graph and just like the actual values for the reactants and products or you could see them already summed up and like in the graph. Um, so the last little bit that we want to look at is phase changes specifically now that we've talked about delta H and endo and exo. So when we look at um, these phase changes, whenever we change from solid to liquid, so think about ice changing to water, we know that that is considered melting. Okay, In order for something to melt, it has to heat up, right? So that means heat is flowing into the system. Okay. And if it's flowing into the system, that means it's endothermic, and that means the delta H has to be positive. Okay, When something changes from a liquid to a solid, so the reverse, we know that's considered freezing when we go from water to ice. In order for that to happen, it has to cool down, which means it flows out of the system or the ice or the water whatever it is so that's an exothermic process because the heat must re um, leave the system and so that means our delta H is negative okay now if we change from a liquid to a gas that is considered oops that's considered vaporization. Um, now that also includes evaporating or boiling. Those are the two types of vaporization. And so in order for that to happen, heat has to flow into the system because it has to get warmer, which means it's endothermic and our delta H is positive. When we reverse that, um, we gas to liquid is condensation. And condensation, in order to happen, has to cool down. So again, the heat has to flow out of the system. So this is an exothermic process, and our delta H is negative. And if we change from a solid to gas directly without skipping it, this is called um, sublimation. You see this with dry ice um, a lot of times, sublimation has to get warmer. So that means heat is flowing into the system and this is a endothermic process and so delta H is going to be positive and apparently I left off um, going from a gas to solid um, so the reverse and that is called um, deposition and that would mean that the heat is flowing out of the system that it's exothermic and that our delta H is negative Okay, now one thing to keep in mind is that in all phase changes, the energy or heat is being used to um, break the in 
deter molecular forces, um, not to break, um, it's not trying to break the bonds themselves or those intra molecular forces and therefore um, there is no chemical change. Okay, all of these changes are physical processes. Okay, these are all physical processes. And so now that we've really talked about heat, um, endo and exo, how to calculate the change in heat or the change in that energy, um, how we've looked at the units and the way it um, affects phases, you've got practice problems for things um, on the bottom of your page. So I would begin to work on those and good luck.